Uh, thank you everyone for taking time out of your day today to join us to learn about best practices for offboarding users in G Suite. My name is Rob Moore and I'm the Director of Customer Support for SuiteBriar. Through our help desk, we often receive questions regarding best practices for deleting user accounts, recycling license, and maintaining former user data from our clients. Uh, because of this, we wanted to dedicate one of our monthly webinars to this topic. Before we begin with that, though, I also wanted to announce some changes that are in the works for SuiteBriar clients. Uh, we've been working on a customer portal recently that will provide our customers with a signature management tool so you can easily update user signatures for your domain. Uh, it's also going to provide easy access to the SuiteBriar license manager that's been active now for a minute. Uh, so admins can add their own licenses to their account. So if you're not already uh, put into that license portal, uh, please let us know. We can get a super admin account assigned to that. You can add your own licenses now, but the new portal is going to allow you an easier access point for that. And then finally, a new support portal that will allow an easy way for you to both open support tickets as well as track existing tickets progress and include a, a new knowledge base that we're currently compiling for our clientele. So all of these are currently in beta and will be released soon for your use. So please keep an eye out for upcoming newsletter announcements with more details about each. Oops, one too many. Today we'll begin by discussing Google's new archive user license SKU for those of you who are unfamiliar. Uh, we will also take a quick look at a third party option for user lifecycle management called Cloud Manager. Our primary focus today will be how to secure an account after a user leaves, how to transfer their data to another user, and how to recycle that license for a new user. Sorry, distracted by a question there for a minute. We'll come back to the questions here at the end, guys. All right, so let's begin by looking at the new archive license. Archive licensing has just recently been introduced by Google and is available to the G Suite business and enterprise SKUs for $4 and $7 respectively. This is unavailable for basic licensing because basic does not include Google Vault, which is required to access the data when you put an archive license on a user. Uh, with archive licensing, there are some things to note. This is not a full G Suite license, meaning you will not be able to receive mail to this address nor ex access the apps like Gmail and Drive with this username. This license only maintains the data so it is accessible by vault for e-discovery and export. This can be particularly useful if you have a strict company retention policy for old user data. Now let's head over to a training environment I have set up to walk through some basic account management when a user leaves your organization. Most everything we do for this first demonstration will take place on the user page, so it can all be done pretty quickly. We will suspend the account and reset the password. Then we will log the user out of any devices and apps that may have access to the account. Next, we will change the account recovery information to something we can access or remove altogether. Finally, we will rename the account and assign this address to another user as an alias so they can receive any new mail sent to the former user. So let's go ahead and jump over into our demo environment here. So this is my demo environment. Like I said, we're really going to jump into the user page to do the majority of this. So first we will secure the account by putting it into a suspended state. Once this is done, the user will not be able to access their Gmail or Drive data by logging into their account. While in a suspended state, it is important to note that this account will not receive mail or accept calendar invitations. Any document shared with this account will still be accessible while the account is suspended. So let's go ahead and pick our guy today. For today's demonstration, we're going to go ahead and pick on SpongeBob. Now, hopefully most of you are familiar with this page. We've got a lot of different information about the account. Over here to the left, we kind of have a panel where we can make some quick, quick changes for this guy. All right, so for SpongeBob, we're gonna come down here under more and click this and we see we can suspend this user. So we'll go ahead and suspend this account. We'll see user license fees still apply because the data is still being maintained. The data will be kept, but they will not receive emails and calendar invitations, just like I had warned you about a moment ago. So we're gonna go ahead and suspend this account. 
Now, this is only going to be a temporary change in most instances. Uh, but if you have somebody that leaves the company, uh, maybe less than ideal situations, and you just want to make sure they're locked out, this is the quickest, fastest, easiest way to do that. Let's just suspend the account. All right, so now that we have it suspended, let's go ahead and reset the password. Again, we have this option right here. So we don't have to go far to do any of this. You'll see we have the option to automatically generate a password. However, for our instances, we really want to make sure that we know the password. So uh, set it to temporarily set it temporarily to something you can remember or big security no no write it down somewhere so you have it handy for later. Right? You don't want to keep that around for forever, but for the purposes of the account deletion and what we're doing today, uh, this should be just fine. So I'm going to go ahead and reset this to something I know. Oh, and you know what? I left it to where it was going to ask me to change it next time, and I don't want that. So I'm going to go ahead and reset it one more time. All right, and the password is done. Now, if you need to email this password to somebody, you can just click this right here. You can enter in an email right there. You can send a copy to yourself, uh, and all of that login information will be distributed via email. So now we have the account suspended. We've reset the password. Let's go ahead and make sure that the account's even more secure. So we're going to come down here to the security panel. Let's open this up. We're going to see a bunch of different options here. The first thing we want to look to, if we scroll down just a little bit, is going to be the cookies. There we go. There we go. So we're going to jump into their applications here. We can see that they are currently logged in and connected to these devices, to these apps. So if we come down here, we can actually just delete this and remove the drive file stream. So file stream might be syncing information from your account into their computer or uh, an, an, another device. And so we want to make sure that we remove that. So if we just click this deletion here, this is going to pull that out of the account. SpongeBob will no longer be able to access Google Drive file stream. So we'll go ahead and pull this out and he has been removed. We also want to take a look at this recovery information. All right. The recovery information didn't used to be available on the admin panel, but they have since moved it over here, which is really nice from an admin perspective, right? Because we used to have to log into the user account and change this information. Now, what this is, is if you are trying to log into the account, the password's changed, you need to do a recovery, they're going to send uh, something to this email or something to this phone number. So we want to either change these to things we have access to, or we can just remove them altogether. We'll go ahead and just pull them out of here for right now. Okay, so we've got the applications taken out. We've got the password change is done. The recovery information is out. Password is reset. So we are looking good. Let's scroll back up to the top here. Oh, sorry. Close this panel up. And now when we scroll down, you'll see the recovery information is no longer there. We have zero applications that are attached. If you need to, you can remote, remove any admin roles or privileges, although I think that's unnecessary. And then if you also have any managed devices, currently SpongeBob, since he is just a uh, sponge living in the pineapple under the sea, does not have any devices. And so uh, we don't have to do any work there, but you would have that accessibility right there as well. All right, so now that we've done all of that, this account is pretty secure. As a last step now, I'm going to show you an easy way to continue receiving uh, email for this user at another address by using an alias. In order to do that, though, we're going to have to rename this user. And by default, what G Suite does then is applies their original username as an alias to this account. So we're also going to have to delete that before it'll allow us to add it somewhere else. All right, so this is as simple as coming over here again, same panel. We haven't had to leave this window yet to do any of this. We're just going to come over and rename this user. 
Now, oftentimes when you're doing this, um, it can be as simple as just adding a one on here. Maybe you want to do a SpongeBob former, something along those lines, just to identify that this is a, a past account that we're not using anymore. Uh, we'll go ahead and just leave it on SpongeBob former for right now and then rename them. Again, we get our warnings here. Online chat services may not be available for this user for up to three days. If we're deleting them, it shouldn't matter, right? And then the current email will be added as an alias. So like I said, we're gonna have to go in and delete that before we're allowed to put it somewhere else. Now we can find the alias right here under the user information. So again, we're just gonna click on that box. You'll see we have access to contact information, aliases, employee information, et cetera, et cetera. We're gonna hit the pencil over here so that we can go ahead and edit this out. And we just wanna remove SpongeBob at sweethills.com. Go ahead and save that change. And now we're gonna pop back out to a different user. So we're done in our SpongeBob panel. Now Carly Trainer is our admin for this account. So we're going to go ahead and assign this to his account so that he's able to receive that mail. So we're gonna come down here to the email aliases. Again, we're just gonna hit this pencil to edit this information. And then we can just start adding this in. If you have multiple domains, you'll see that the domains all, all appear in a Dropbox here. So which one do we want? We're gonna go ahead and apply it to the top level, so spongebob at sweethills.com. And then click Save. Now what's nice about this, folks, is we don't have to put any forwards in place. Nothing like that has to occur. Uh, once we apply this alias to this user, any mail sent to that address is going to flow into their regular inbox. All right. Um, once you go in there, if you want to have that separate, you can go ahead and just create yourself a filter and have that jump it into a label for you. All right. Let's jump back over to our slides here. Now, for our next trick, we will move the user data to another user in the organization. This can include mail, calendar, and drive information, depending on what you are needing to hold on to. Unless you transfer a user's data before deleting the account, it will all be lost. All right, it's important to note that. You are able to recover a deleted user and their data for 20 days after deletion. After that, there's nothing you, I, or anyone else can do to recover it unless you have a full backup saved somewhere. If you're interested in backup solutions, we generally recommend spanning and backupify. If you wanna learn more about that, please contact our help desk and we'd be happy to set you up with information about those products. Now, coming on over, the quickest, easiest way to transfer this stuff over is when you're actually deleting the user. So when you go to process the deletion, you will be given the opportunity to transfer drive files, calendar data, and Google Plus information to another user. If you want to move this data to someone else without deleting them, you can do that as well through the individual app settings for drive and calendar. However, my guess is you're here because you're trying to recoup licenses, delete users, maybe clean up your panel a little bit. Um, so we're going to not demonstrate that, but we're going to look at the deletion issue. So if we come down here again to, to the more option. Oh, and I'm in Carly Trainer's account, so we don't want to do that. Can't delete an admin. I mean, I guess you could, but they'd probably be really upset. So let's scroll back down here and find our SpongeBob former. And click on the more for SpongeBob. Now we see the delete user option is available here since he's not the super admin. And this is pretty straightforward. So if we come in here, you'll see we've got these check boxes. We've got drive and docs up at the top. By default, these three boxes will be checked, all right? You also have some more options. You can include files that are not shared with anyone. So the biggest issue when you delete a user tends to be if they have shared out a sheet with say 50 people at your organization, those people use that document on a regular basis, and you delete the user without transferring it, all of them are suddenly gonna come into work and that document will not be available to them, okay? So shared with files tend to be the biggest issue. However, depending on who they were with your company and what they were doing, you may want files that weren't shared with anyone at all. Maybe there's just things they're working on. Maybe it's just stuff that they have for their own personal use. So if you want to include that, you just check that box as well. Down here, we've got calendar, so we can migrate their calendar over. 
We also have a checkbox here, so we can also release all calendar resources booked in events organized by the user. So if you want to release all of that at the time of deletion, you just go ahead and click this guy as well. And then finally down here at the bottom, we have Google Plus pages. So if you are someone using Google Plus, I know it's not super widespread uh, use, but if you are one of the folks that's using this, you can transfer that information over as well by just leaving this box checked. If you don't want this checked, you can just uninclude Google Plus pages and leave Drive and Docs and Calendar. Um, so you can pick any group of those that you want. Down here on the bottom, we're just going to go ahead and drop an uh, uh, email user in here. So transfer to, we'll go ahead and use Carl. Since he's the admin, we want him to get everything. And then we're going to hit delete. Now, for the sake of our demonstration day, I don't want to hit this button because I want to be able to still access this account and such. And we still have a couple of steps that we need to talk about. Um, but if we hit this delete button, it would transfer all of that over. Now, alternatively, if you don't have any interest in maintaining any of this, we can go ahead and just unselect all of these boxes. And you'll see that part disappears. And now we can just delete the user without migrating anything. All right, let's go ahead and cancel this guy. So that is how to transfer drive docs as well as calendar events. Now what we're going to look at is uh, the mail. All right. Unfortunately, mail cannot be transferred at the time of the user deletion. It'd be real nice if they just put their, that in that box as an option. If you are interested in that, as I know many people are, please submit a feature request to Google. I think a lot of people would benefit from that. However, they've made it uh, a little more difficult for us. So this will need to be done separately before you delete the account. And to do this, we will use the built-in data migration service or DMS as it's called. In order to use this tool, you will need to know the password for the user account and it cannot be in a suspended state. So you will need to reactivate the account to perform a mail migration. All right, so let's come back over here into our demo environment. And as I was saying, we're going to have to reactivate SpongeBob. Otherwise, the DMS will not work. So we're just going to come in here. We're going to reactivate this account. Yes, we would like to do that. And right here, we can now see that the account is active. All right. From this point, guys, we're going to move over to the DMS. So let's actually, we can access that either from account right here. We can go into data migration. Or if we are on the home page, just give it a second to load here so we can see what that looks like. All right, so if you're on your admin homepage, this is what the data migration icon looks like. If you do not see this here, sometimes if you haven't pulled all the icons up, there will be a section below here that will have some of the icons. So if you don't see all of these things, um, I'm on an enterprise here right now, so some of these things may not be available to you, but the data migration certainly will be. So if you don't see him, uh, there should be a button here that says more apps, uh, and you can drag him up to the top. So we'll click right into this data migration here. All right, now the data migration tool gives us the or the uh, ability to move email, contacts, and calendar. However, when we look at contacts and calendar, uh, really our source platforms are only going to be things like Exchange, Office 365, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're looking to do that, you're going to want to do it from a different location. With contacts, really, we just recommend doing an export import it tends to be kind of the quickest, easiest way. Mm -hmm. Hold on, now we have to back out. data migration. Okay, and so we're going to go ahead and pick email and select continue. Now with the migration source for this, the first option is G Suite. I do not recommend selecting G Suite. I recommend instead just going with Gmail. All right, so let's go ahead and highlight the Gmail option and then we're going to hit connect. Now we're going to be given some options. All right, we have a migration start date. How far back do we need to go? By default, it'll be set to the past six months. They also have a year, they have three months, past month. We can go ahead and set a custom date in here. So maybe you have years of data you need to go back through. 
we can go ahead and drop back here. Let's go ahead and say March 1st, 2007. That should be everything that SpongeBob has ever put together in the office. All right. Choose migration options as you need, right? We can migrate deleted mail if we want. We can migrate junk mail. We can exclude following top level folders from migration. So if you want to move these things along, uh, we can go ahead and just check these boxes here. We're going to go ahead and leave those off though for right now and then hit select users. Now from this screen, this is where we have the ability to add the users we're going to migrate. You are able to use this tool to migrate off other platforms as well. If you have maybe a user coming in from a Yahoo environment or something along those lines, you can use this tool to migrate that mail into the environment as well. However, we are currently configured for Gmail, right? So if we need to change that platform, it's kind of hidden. Up here, we've got these three dots. We can click this and you'll see right here, we have the ability to exit a migration. I get a lot of calls and questions about this. If you come into this and you see this screen and you don't know what this is configured for, we can view those settings to see exactly where we're at, or we can just go ahead and exit the migration altogether so we can start fresh. Since we know this is exactly what we need configured, we're gonna go ahead and just select a user down here. Now, I always start with where I'm migrating to. So we're gonna go ahead and put in um, Carl. And we'll see, it's gonna to start to populate those answers or the, uh, those users for us. So we'll go ahead and select Carl here. And then we have to remember that we renamed this account to SpongeBob Former. Otherwise, we wouldn't find them. So we have SpongeBob Former at sweethills.com. Now we're gonna click authorize here. And this is where it becomes important that you know the user's password because you're gonna to have to enter it in to allow it to authenticate. So we've got SpongeBob former at Sweet Hills. We're gonna click next here, enter our password in. And it's going to, okay, it's gonna make us pick another password. Security, security. All right, now we're gonna get all the permissions. This is going to allow G Suite Data Migration Service to read, compose, send, and permanently delete all your email from Gmail. We're gonna go ahead and click allow. And it's gonna spit us out a code. We're gonna to need to grab this. So we're gonna copy it to our clipboard. And we're gonna take it back over to our admin panel. Drop the authorization code in here. And hit start. And now we'll see the migration is going to start. We're going to close this window out. We're going to have the name that it's going to, the name that it's coming from, and the status. It's going to initialize for a few minutes here. It's going to evaluate how much mail is in this, uh, this user's account. And depending on what that number is, this can be a very quick or a very slow process. APIs limit the uh, amount of mail that can come into an account within an amount of time. Uh, and so I've seen this only take a couple of hours. I've seen it be done in a couple of minutes. I've also seen it take up to three weeks. And albeit that user had over a quarter million messages, something like 300,000 emails they've been holding on to or something like that. But be aware, if it's an exceptionally large mailbox size, this can take a while, all right? And that's just because of the limitations of the APIs and such. So we're gonna go ahead and select him. I don't know how I clicked on that. But as far as that goes, this mail is migrating now. All right, um, you can come into your DMS panel and check this status at any point. If you just click on the icon and come in here, it'll have a percentage done. Um, if it's an exceptionally large box and you find it get hung up at like 99%, um, if it's been there for a couple of days, you're pretty safe to go ahead and just end that migration, just stop it um, by selecting the three dots and hitting stop migration. Uh, generally speaking at 99%, if it's been there for a couple of days, everything is over. Uh, but sometimes it does get hung up on that with the exceptionally large boxes. Um, if for some reason it fails, you can come back in here and you can reset this all up. You can do the password again and all of that. Any mail that has migrated over to that account will not re-migrate to that account, right? So if you have to set this up again, maybe uh, you started the migration, some of the mail moved over and then something happened, you had to stop it. 
if you come in at a later date and start that migration again, it's not going to bring over those old messages that it's already transferred. All right, so that is the DMS tool. Now, if your company has a particularly strict retention policy, you may need to look to a third party tool like Cloud Migrator to migrate the user data. When you use the DMS tool to migrate mail, you are able to select and migrate the trash folder as well. But this is only going to contain messages deleted in the last 30 days. Great. After 30 days, the Gmail trash automatically empties out any messages, so they only retain it for that amount of time. Um, Cloud Migrator is now able to move a user's vault data, which will contain everything the user has received, sent, and deleted depending on your preset vault retention policy. So if you have your retention in vault for emails set for this user to 100 years and you transfer that vault data over, you're going to get all of that. All right. So if you're using the DMS tool, that's not going to be the exact same situation. You're going to get what's currently in their mailbox. You're going to get what's currently in their trash. You're going to get the, the things that are current. All right. If you were looking to really simplify your onboarding offboarding operations, as well as many other tasks within your G Suite environment, Cloud Manager could be a good fit for you. This has customizable pre-built workflows for these processes that allow you to complete all steps necessary with just a couple of clicks. If you're interested in hearing more about that product, please reach out to us at helpdesk at sweetbriar.com and we'd be happy to help facilitate a demo for your organization. The last thing we will discuss today is recycling a G Suite license. And this is pretty simple. Once a user is deleted, their license becomes available for reassignment. All right, easy peasy. Things to note about this. It can take up to 24 hours before the license is ready for assignment. It's really rare that I see it take that long, however. Generally, you'll be able to reuse the license in a matter of minutes, if not a couple of hours. After the license is available, you're just going to go in and create a new user from scratch. Please do not rename a former account to a new user. I've seen this done in the past. Uh, there can be data attached to it that you are unaware of, and this can cause issues down the road for the new user. Most commonly where I see that is with that account recovery information. So since that's available in the admin panel now, probably not as big an issue. However, we still always recommend that a new user in your environment starts fresh with their own account. Now, this is just as simple as coming back over to our panel here. We'll just look at our directory. We'll go ahead and click into users. It's going to verify me. Security, security. Also, Bugs Bunny on this account. <laughs> All right. So coming back in here, we're in the user panel now. They used to have a nice plus sign over here, just like everything else, but they decided they didn't want to continue on with that for whatever reason. So now we have this add new user up here. We go ahead and click that. And we can go ahead and just start entering in their information to create that account. Now, most of you will probably have it set up to auto assign licenses. That's generally the way we configure these things for you. So when you create this account, it'll automatically assign a license to them. If for whatever reason you don't have it set up like that, we can take a look at, say, Elmer Fudd here. We can scroll down here to the bottom and we see the licenses. He has three licenses assigned currently. If we click this open, if you did not have licenses automatically assigned, you'll see this one was automatically assigned to him. Uh, you can come in here and go ahead and assign those licenses. All right. Uh, this is also where you would add the archive license if you were going to use the archive license solution. So you would just come in here. When you sign the archive license to the user, their regular license will automatically become unassigned and available. We don't need both licenses on the account. The archive license will take precedent over the other. All right. Well, I've got, uh, that's everything we had to look at today, folks. We've got a little time here for some questions. So if you have any uh, questions at all, you can go ahead and enter those into the panel here. I'll give it just a few moments. Um, if you have to get out, maybe you're late for lunch or you're starving and you've heard enough, uh, you can always contact, contact us at helpdesk at sweetbriar.com for more information. If that's the case, though, uh, have a great afternoon. We're glad you were able to join us.
Uh, if you've got a couple minutes or you've got some questions, uh, we're going to stick around here for just a few minutes to make sure we get those answered for you. All right, so thank you very much. Rob, it looks like we do have three questions. Okay. Uh, the first is about a recording, and I can field that for you. We will be offering uh, the recording of this webinar along with the slides, and those will be made available to everyone tomorrow. Um, we'll also be sharing them in, in our next newsletter. Um, so the next question we have is, and I think you touched on this earlier, how do I separate transferred email from my own email? So you've, um, you touched on that earlier, so if you could answer that now again, that'd be great. Sure, absolutely. So. If I just come over here, guys, I'm going to jump into just a mailbox to show you. Gmail, there we go. So by and large, what we're doing here is creating a filter. Now, you can do this before you transfer the mail, or you can do it retroactively and just apply it to messages that are in the inbox. Um, but essentially, we're just going to come into the Gmail inbox. We're going to create a filter, and we're going to set that up to look for anything either to the deleted user or from the deleted user. And we're just going to have it dump all of that into a folder. So if we come up here, we can go ahead and hit the drop down. Probably take just a second here for the box to load. Now, hopefully, you're all familiar with this. This is the advanced search options here. We're going to go ahead and put in SpongeBob. At sweet pills. You'll see we've got his little name right here, and then it applies or it shows under Bugs Bunny now as well because remember we applied it as an alias to that account. So anything from that user or also to that user, we're going to come down here, create a filter. We can have this just skip our inbox. Obviously, we probably don't need all of those in there. However, keep in mind. Uh, if you have the alias set to that account, this is also going to apply to those messages. So we want to make sure and just take note of that. Um, so we can have it skip the, the inbox. We can go ahead and just apply a label, uh, and we can create a label here. So we could just make a new label and call it SpongeBob or whatever the case may be. Um, whoever the user is that we're deleting, obviously. We have several other options is what we want to do. If you're doing this beforehand, you'll see down here we have zero matching conversations. If you're doing it retroactively, this should apply to all of the messages that have come over already. So you'll see that number here. Uh, we can just apply that to those messages as well. And then we're going to hit the Create Filter. And everything that comes in then from that point is going to go ahead and drop into that label. All right. What's our next question, Megan? Sure. Thanks for answering the, this or that one. Let's see. So this comes in from Kenny. Um, why would someone use the archive license over a vault license? Well, a vault license, so with G Suite Business and G Suite Enterprise, vault is included. It does not require a vault license. With uh, G Suite Basic, if you want to use vault, it requires a separate vault license, which I want to say is $5 per user per month. Though that might have changed with the price increase here. I haven't, I haven't moved one of those in a second. Um, but that would be in addition to what you're already paying for uh, the basic. So now basic is $6 a month. You add the vault license on there. Now you're at $11 a month. Um, the business archive license is only going to be $4 a month. Um, so it might be a good opportunity if you're looking at using vault licenses. That might be a good time to consider moving up to G Suite business. Um, and we have offers that we can make available to you uh, if you've been on a client with us for a while and uh, you're not currently on a discounted rate then we could certainly work with you on some of the pricing there. But um, in regards to G Suite Business and Enterprise, it's it's unnecessary to add the vault license in the first place. And with basic, I just don't know that it would be cost effective. But it's certainly an option. Great, thank you. Uh, and we have another question here from Glenn. Can you explain the advantages of using Backupify for offboarded users? I am not super knowledgeable on Backupify, so I really can't speak to it. I'd be happy to set up an appointment with you if you want to send our information. Uh, we can put you together with somebody on the sales team that has a little more knowledge on Backupify and spanning uh, so that you can learn more about that. But it's, it's a little outside of my comfort zone, so I really can't provide you with that information. Sorry. Okay, great. I'll follow up with you, Ken, on that. Um, it looks like we have another question in from Mary. 
Can I run multiple migrations at the same time? Yeah, so you can as long as it's coming from the same source. So if you are, maybe you just want to have one day a month that you do user management, you want to go ahead and log in there. Um, let's go ahead and jump over to our admin panel here and I'll just show you what I'm talking about. So we're going to come back down to the data migration service. Now, so if you have users coming out of the same platform, maybe you have a bunch of folks coming over from Yahoo, maybe you just, uh, maybe your company just bought out another company or something, you have to bring those users in. Once this is configured for a platform, you can do as many users as you want out of that platform. So right now we're configured for G Suite. We can see now SpongeBob 99% uh, complete, 77 of about 77 emails migrated. So we, this is exactly what the status update looks like for you if you want to come in here and check. And like I was saying, you can see it's kind of hung at 99%. So I would recommend you give a little time there. But um, at any rate, uh, if you come down here to the plus, we can go ahead and just add multiple users. All right, so we can add as many folks as we want to in here, uh, and, and this guy will run for all of them at the same time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That does it for questions from my end. Okay. All right, we'll give it just another minute here to see if any other questions pop up. like I have any more questions filtering in. Uh, this is our contact for our help desk right here, folks. Helpdesk at scoopbriar.com. If you have any questions about any of the stuff we've looked at today, um, please feel free and reach out to us. Like Megan said earlier, uh, we will be sharing out this recording. So if you have any information or any questions about anything that we're in the slide deck here, uh, you'll have access to that very shortly. Uh, um, I'm sorry, Rob, it looks like we had one more question slide in. Perfect. What do we got? Uh, this is from Josh. If there are multiple users who want to look at an email for a former user, what would we recommend as best practice? If you have several users that want to see, so a lot of times what we have here is maybe you don't dump all of those emails into an existing account. Maybe what you do is you create an archive user account, right? And the only thing that account does is collects mail and data from users that are being deleted. So in the instance of that, if that's the situation, I would recommend using an archive uh, account like that. And you can delegate access then to that mailbox to other folks so that they could access it as well. Alternatively, you also have, um, if they have access to the vault, if they have that administrator privilege, the vault will be able to access all of that mail as well. Uh, so if you're talking about historical data, you could use that, possibly assign a vault administrator uh, to that person that needs access in. Um, the other option, I think, would probably be a better option is just to have that archive user account and then delegate access to the folks that need it. Great. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Any other questions? Doesn't look like it. All right. All right. Well, again, folks, if you have any questions that pop up as soon as you walk out the door, that tends to be what happens to me. So I completely understand. Uh, helpdesk at sweetfire.com. Go ahead and send an email in there. If it's something about Backupify or spanning or Cloud Manager or Cloud Migrator or any of the other things that we looked at today that are third party tools, uh, we can set you up with a demo of those uh, to help you out. I think I might have just got another question. Uh, nope, it was just a reply, so we're all set. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. Uh, I'll give you back these last 15, 20 minutes, so maybe you can actually enjoy some of your lunch, uh, or maybe you can just get out of the office a little bit early here, holiday weekend coming up and whatnot, so I'm sure we're all excited about that. Thank you so much for your time, folks. It's been a pleasure. Again, my name is Rob Moore. I'm Director of Customer Support for Sweetbriar. Uh, thank you, Megan, for your help. We hope to talk to you soon. Everyone have a great day, all right?